They say revenge is a dish that's best served cold. Hey, okay, but in Miami, there was another kind of revenge. It was hot, violent, and inspired by envy and a betrayal. It's a story that has everything in it. It has fast cars and beautiful women and drugs and millions of dollars, kidnapping and crime. A story so compelling, Mark Wahlberg has turned it into a major Hollywood movie. These guys wanted what self-made millionaire Mark Schiller had. <laughs> the houses, the cars, the beautiful wife. He'd been living the good life. You want the people's money? Yes. And now, they do anything to get it. How could you give him a job? A true story, told by the people who lived through it. It's one even Emily Thorne would love. Revenge for real. This program is based on real events that occurred in Miami. It contains interviews with the real people involved and dramatic recreations based on what really happened. They say living well is the best revenge. And self-made millionaire Mark Marcello Schiller was living well. I started uh, creating businesses since I was nine, um, finding different ways to make money. I would stand outside of the uh, supermarket wall housing in Brooklyn and offer to carry people's groceries home for a dime a quarter. He grew up poor, first in Argentina and then New York. Come on, you ready? But now he had a beautiful wife and two beautiful children. And everything he touched seemed to turn to gold. Come to your daddy. Come over here. I was making a considerable amount of money. But I lived a I lived a normal life. Of course, normal is a relative term. In his safe, 14000 in cash, 100 k in his checking account. He owned a number of businesses, a successful accounting firm. Accounting practice, it was a cash cow. A nutritional supplement company. Plus, he had investments. A 34-story condominium tower. A restaurant. Oh, yes. In the Cayman Islands, half a million in offshore accounts. And he had a friend. George Delgado. Hi, Mark. His assistant this? introduced them. She comes to me and she says, my husband, George Delgado, Jorge Delgado, he's just lost his job. We're living with my parents. Uh, could you give him a job? And uh, I've always been, you know, softy. So I said, OK, bring him in. So he started out as a gopher. But after only four years, he'd worked his way up to become Mark's right-hand man. It's a good stuff. Yeah. Mark became a very good friend of George, taught him the business and kind of made him a man that could do something and support himself. George Delgado devoted his life to Schiller. My wife would make him food. Um, he was like part of the family. And Schiller wanted to reward his loyalty. What happened eventually, I said, OK, let's do something else. I said, let's uh, form a uh, mortgage buying and selling business. He'd made partner. And Delgado was grateful, of course. But it wasn't enough. He wanted more. His own deals, his own identity. He wanted to improve himself. One more, let's go. And all that started to come true for him at a place called the Sun Gym. Good job, man. Right on. Well, the Sun Gym was a place where people were pumping iron, they were using steroids to help themselves look better, and they were interested in breaking into the Miami scene. And no one was more interested than the manager of the gym, Danny Lugo. They're both checking out. Lugo was a very personable guy. He looked sort of like a thug, but he was a very charming man. He was, uh, for lack of a better term, smooth. He had wives that he divorced that still would do anything for him. If you had to pick a word, you'd say he was the brains behind this organization. But I have to say that's really stretching the word brains. But you don't have to be smart to be dangerous. And Lugo was soon filling Delgado's head with ideas. Not all of them 100% legal. So what are you doing tonight? Right from the get-go, I didn't like him. He was one of these characters you can tell was bad news. So, uh, Lugo had a criminal record for fraud, and Schiller says he told Delgado not to trust him. I pulled him and said, who's this guy? He's a friend I made at the gym. You're going, you're going to the gym? I said, you got to be kidding me. If he had enough, Jorge, he was a slim little guy. He, he's not a gym type. And that's when Mark starts to try and pull away from George. Hey, Mark. 
When Delgado started getting into shady business deals with Lugo, Schiller says he finally cut him off, dissolving their partnership. I'm not signing this. I go, listen, last thing I'm going to tell you is if you stay friends with Lugo, um, you're going to end up being in trouble. Just remember these words today. And that was the last time I talked to him. Delgado was devastated. What was he going to do for money? He was back to square one. George Delgado feels at some point that he was shortchanged. He actually had George believing somehow that Mark had cheated him out of $200,000 and George felt he needed to be vindicated. George Delgado wanted revenge. Gym manager Lugo and his buddy Adrian Dorball commiserated <laughs> nice. and took him to the place they always went when they wanted to think. They told Delgado Schiller wasn't his friend. What's up, buddy? What's on your mind? Why you look They so told dumb? him Schiller had ripped him off. We're here to help. And they had a novel idea how to get what was owed to him. I'm thinking, uh, they said we kidnap him. What drives a man to betray his mentor? Well, he was an ex-mentor now. An ex-mentor who had everything Delgado wanted. He knew you could always count on me. Whatever problem he had, whatever he had, he needed. Well, Delgado needed a lot. I would never said no to him. Um, I was always there for him as a friend. And that was really all this was about. George Delgado's with his two buddies, and he's complaining. I deserve more. George needed his friend's money. After all, Schiller had cut him off. Wasn't Delgado entitled to a little revenge? So Lugo gets a brilliant idea of it. We'll shake him down, and then we'll let him go, and that's it. Think about it. That was the plan. The problem is it turned into a lot more than that. I don't know what Lugo painted in his head that made him change, but from the time he met Lugo, he became a different person. They say envy burns brightest in the dark. They all wanted what they didn't have, and I think that they saw some money in front of them and decided that it would be theirs for the taking. Come on, man, let's go. Of course, not every plan emerges fully grown. The attempts that they made to kidnap Schiller so they could force him to return the money, if this case wasn't so tragic, would be comical. It looks like he's home. They were so inept. They made attempt after attempt, hiding under blankets in his front yard, dressed as ninjas, to capture him, only to be thwarted by the headlights of an approaching car. Abort, abort. And then they're running through backyards, yelling, abort, abort, like this is some kind of uh, CIA mission. Oh, there he is, there he is, there he is. Duck, duck. There were some things that happened in hindsight that I see now, but at the time, I pay no attention to them. But practice makes perfect. Is he looking over here? And the gang from the Sun Gym was about to get lucky. OK, all right, let's go. You ready? Don't mess this up. Mark Schiller is on his way home from his restaurant. Now, 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 now. I usually parked in front. For that day, for some reason, I parked in the back. <laughs> All of a sudden, three guys approach me from behind. I thought they wanted to steal the car. So I said, if you want the car, take it. They have tasers. They have guns. And they just begin beating and mostly tasing him. Come on, come on! They drag him into a van. Hurry up, get him in the car! I was terrified. I just thought it was a hit. They were just going to take me somewhere, shoot me. Take him up. They put tape around my eyes. They put me in between the driver's seat and the first bench. Yeah, yeah! Woo! The van races away, and one of the kidnappers makes a phone call. The eagle has landed. And for Mark Schiller, the first hints that this isn't random, it's personal. Shut it! You don't have the right to live the life you do. And one of the guys said, you have no right to live the life you do. And I go, oh, so they know me. <laughs> they were having a great time. He thought that they won the lottery. Grab that watch, man. That's they take his presidential Rolex, his jewelry, and then suddenly drive into a warehouse. So they took me out of the van. And that's when basically the torture begins. <laughs> and then they started beating me with bad shock. 
Yeah, I'm punching. They were taking turns, I guess. And finally, the motive becomes clear. We want to talk about some of your assets. Give us a list of it. Come on. We want a list of your assets. And I go, what for? I wasn't really panicked because whatever they wanted, they weren't going to get it if I was dead. But if you want to get to someone, threaten the ones they love. Your pretty wife and your two beautiful, beautiful children. They told me, if you don't cooperate and give us what we want, we're going to bring your wife and uh, kids here. We're going to take turns raping your wife. Over and over <laughs> again. And we're going to um, chain your kids to the wall. Schiller says in that one instant, everything changed. OK, I'll do it. All right, start talking. So whatever you want, you can have it. But let's make a deal. You let my wife and kids go out of the country, and you can have whatever you want. That's the deal, you know? Because that was their leverage. And you, once they lost their leverage, that was it. At least I thought so, anyway. But the kidnappers had a different kind of leverage in mind. It's ringing. They made me call my wife. Hello. And I said, hey, uh, she said, where are you? I'm fine. I had to go on a business trip. Because they would tell me what I had to say. And the next day I said, I want you to do me a favor. Just take a change of clothes and leave the country. Tonight? Are you kidding? Leave everything else there just where it is. Right now, you got to leave right now. Good job, Mark. Good job. His wife is Colombian. And, uh, you know, in South America, back then, a lot of times, if you were kidnapped, there was a pretty good chance the police were involved. And so with that in mind, when he called his wife and told her, you need to go to your mother's in Colombia and don't call anybody, especially the police, she didn't. In those first days, Mark had been racking his brain trying to figure out who these guys could be. And then, with one remark, the kidnappers give it away. We know your assets. And finally he said, since you're not giving us a list of assets, we're going to give you um, a list of your assets. Bingo. There was only one person. About the $10,000 you got locked up. The half a million in overseas accounts. Condos in South Beach. They had the list of assets better than I did. So I knew automatically Delgado. He knew George Delgado was involved, and he had recognized Danny Lugo's voice from prior meetings. So he'd put the pieces together. What Schiller didn't know was what these guys were going to do next. Sign right there. <laughs> and that starts the making of the perfect crime. Thank you, buddy because they then have him to themselves. And if he dies, his wife's in Colombia. Nobody really knows what happened. She doesn't trust the police. These idiots could actually get away with it. What was it like for Delgado, standing in the shadows while his associates torture his friend? How he must have suffered but there were compensations. That's huge, man. Look at this. Before Mark's wife and kids were even on the plane, they had moved into Schiller's house. They liked that house in the mid-'90s. That was an expensive house in Miami. It was in a gated community in an yeah. upscale development. The servant had become the master, and life was good. They told the neighbors that they were in the CIA. And the neighbors bought it. <laughs> 